Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So, hi uh, uh, everyone. Um, we are happy to uh, launch this uh, a new event among the Phenomics uh, webinar series. Uh, this one is entitled Low Cost Vectors and Sensors for Plant Phenotyping, and it's brought to you by the IPPN Affordable Phenotyping Working Group. Mm -hmm. Some uh, uh, general uh, information before we, uh, we start. And maybe you are not familiar with this uh, Phenomics webinar uh, series. We are always uh, seeking for new contributions uh, for all plant phenotyping related work field across all career uh, research uh, and industry. And uh, you can have contribution among two formats, single talks or a thematic session like the one we have today. The, the time slot is always the, the same, every second Friday uh, at 2 o'clock uh, CDT. And um, uh, this is open for, uh, for submission on the link you can find on uh, this uh, web link. And the next uh, webinar will occur on November 13th, uh, and it will be also a field uh, session with the free um, speakers. Uh, we are also organizing a survey uh, so to have your feedback on uh, the, um, uh, how to improve uh, and uh, evolve the, these uh, webinars. Uh, the, the link to this survey is available also on uh, the uh, Phenomics webinar webpage, and it will be also copy-pasted on the chat uh, window. Uh, so please uh, take a, a, a few minutes uh, to, to, to give us your, your feedback on how to improve uh, these webinars. Uh, today, the talk is provided uh, from uh, uh, actors and uh, um, members of the um, uh, IPPN. Uh, IPPN is uh, an international um, plant phenotyping uh, network and it has various activities, among which uh, working groups. So these working groups are dedicated to specific topics and um, the, the, the topic of, uh, of today is about uh, affordable plant phenotyping methods and a platform. And uh, together with uh, Mark Muller Lino, which who will uh, take care of um, uh, uh, collecting your uh, feedback during the, 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 the talk, and myself, David Rousseau, uh, uh, today we will uh, uh, be chairing this, uh, this session. Um, uh, inside this uh, working group, uh, we are always happy to, uh, to welcome a new, uh, new members. So if you are uh, interested by this topic, please contact the, the four uh, steering committee uh, via the um, uh, uh, email address indicated uh, on the website. And we may also advertise a bit uh, the activity plan for uh, 2021, which includes a workshop on phenotyping with mini computers and low-cost cameras. You can register up to 26th of May. It will happen whatever the sanitary uh, condition, either uh, so on-site or um, mixed or even fully uh, uh, online. You already have some uh, online tutorials available also on the second link on the right, uh, provided by our group in Angers on the bioimaging research group called Imorphen. Uh, let's now uh, move uh, to uh, the speakers of today. So we have three talks. Uh, we will uh, highlight some recent uh, um, scientific work which has been published in uh, the special issue on low-cost sensors and vectors for plant phenotyping. The first talk will be by uh, Antoine uh, Fournier uh, on the uh, talk entitled Towards Low-Cost Hyperspectral Single Pixel Imaging for Plant Phenotyping. So very focused at the level of the sensor itself. Uh, Antoine is from Arvalis, uh, France, and uh, I'm happy to um, uh, give him the, the mic or the, and, uh, and um, the screen. So please, uh, Antoine, uh, we are happy to, to listen to your presentation. Thank you, David. And uh, also thank you, uh, Mark, uh, and on behalf of the working group. Um, and uh, thank you to Philippe and Jennifer to host us. Okay. 
Uh, I will uh, present you uh, the work uh, around uh, the, um, the low-cost uh, hyperspectral single pixel imaging that we developed here in uh, Lanyon uh, with our, in our group um, composed of uh, people from Arvalis and Photonics uh, Bretagne. Um, so first of all, uh, what is single pixel imagery? Uh, single pixel uh, imagery is one of the solution to solve uh, one of the old dilemma of a sensor uh, designer, uh, which is uh, the triangle of the sensor. Um, when you have to choose between uh, the quality and the quantity of spatial information, of uh, spectral information and intensity information, um, because uh, nothing is free, uh, you always have to, to find compromise uh, uh, in your technical solution uh, between uh, those, three, uh, goal, those three goals. Um, and the single pixel uh, imagery uh, is a, a new technique uh, proposed at the beginning of the century to, to shift uh, the spatial information uh, sampling um, charge to other components of the system in instead of the sensitive area. Um, since uh, the early 2000, um, the, uh, the sen imaging sensors are an array or matrix of uh, sensitive um, uh, sensors uh, put together, uh, but uh, uh, at the beginning of this century, we, we propose um, uh, a mathematical framework and also a few implementations uh, to uh, um, uh, obtain the angular, the uh, spatial information uh, from the projection device or uh, by modulating the reception before a punctual sensor. So single pixel imaging is, is using a pixel, a one pixel sensor um, to uh, interrogate, interrogate successively a uh, different um, a series of spatial resolved pattern uh, while measuring the correlated intensity on a detector. Uh, I recommend this uh, good uh, review of uh, Edgar MP you know, on nature photonics. Which, uh, which is a, a, good, reason, uh, a good review. Um, this permit uh, by having uh, just one point, a punctual uh, sensor uh, to access um, greater uh, performance, uh, greater uh, other aspect of the physical signal you are searching, uh, and also to reduce cost for a similar uh, uh, intensity or spectral uh, quality information. Um, main uh, data in uh, this technology, uh, the milestones uh, are uh, first uh, um, theoretical uh, proposition of uh, this comprehensive sensing uh, solution uh, proposed by Donohoe in, uh, in 2006. Uh, Duarte and Al is uh, um, the, the paper who populating, uh, who uh, make a, a large uh, accessibility of uh, these techniques and Gibson et al. is a quite uh, complete uh, recent review about it. Then, now we know what is single pixel imagery. Um, why use it in plant phenotyping and what could it be good for? Um, since uh, years, uh, Several teams uh, used the hyperspectral sensor actively or passively uh, to, um, to uh, in, uh, investigate uh, uh, nitrogen uh, spatial distribution or uh, disease uh, uh, symptom, disease progression uh, at canopy or uh, organ uh, level. Um, we, we believe that hyperspectral uh, can bring uh, some uh, innovative information for plant science, but uh, we also believe in uh, uh, open innovation. So um, um, 
to tackle the, the phenotyping dilemma, which is a lot of use cases, a lot of uh, context, uh, and a lot of uh, technical solution, we have to, to, to work on, uh, on both legs and uh, developing the solution instrumentation. Meanwhile, uh, applicative uh, user uh, can already uh, manipulate the data. Um, this is uh, the, the backbone of our, of our strategy to, to give you uh, sensors and the data uh, to explore application. Uh, meanwhile, we, we improve the, the instruments. Um, and we'll try uh, through this instrument to share standards and uh, to uh, spread uh, sensing strategies uh, for the multiplicity of specific sense and needs uh, that uh, we can encounter in our phenotyping, uh, plant phenotyping uh, um, uh, jobs. Uh, specifically with a macro image uh, sent from a few uh, decimeters to a few meters. Uh, in terms of uh, size of the scene, but also in uh, uh, walking range. Um, and also a lot of uh, different uh, environments uh, in fields above ground in greenhouse, uh, who are a lot of consequences in matter of, of uh, light environment and um, uh, accessible resolution and constraints on the time of exposition, uh, etc. Um, and uh, we, uh, we think also that uh, hyperspectral can bring uh, something to, to our fields uh, on the condition that uh, we, we go to the smart sensor so that we can harmonize um, and standardize the, the nature and uh, the levels of the data um, and also uh, diminish uh, the volumetry of the data uh, by um, making a higher level uh, interpretation in matter of uh, biophysics or agronomy directly uh, at the back of the of the sensor in this uh, philosophy of um, having a sensor uh, economically affordable um, we 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 implement a one uh, solution of a single pixel imagery um, to, to ease and uh, to speed up the spread among the, the community to allow you to make yourself your hyper, hypercube measurement and also to discuss with the community about the strategy of single pixel imagery. Um, so we, we wanted a, a, an economical affordable solution. Um, we accept to, to, to limit the, the development to something who will work in a dark chamber. So you have to to be in the dark to make the image. Um, we need uh, something which is low tech with no optical um, optimization of the, uh, of the setup or the, the less uh, optical uh, optimization possible. And uh, we uh, accept also to, to have a low throughput uh, sensing method. Um, so when you choose a single pixel imager, you have to choose your spatial modulation way. Uh, do you want to, to modulate the uh, projection or the uh, collection of uh, the light? Uh, we uh, opt to the modulation uh, of the projection, which is easier. Um, through a modulation technique of DMD, uh, so digital micro mirror device, and uh, SLM, which is um, a crystal, uh, liquid crystal uh, matrices, um, who are directly implemented on, uh, on the desk uh, pro projector. Uh, we prefer to, you have to show also the pattern basis. Uh, it exists uh, three main family, which is uh, Adamar, uh, Fourier, and uh, a more general, general, general generic one, um, the web weblets. Um, we choose Fourier because uh, it is um, because of synergy with uh, all optical solution for creating patterns. Uh, and the sensor type uh, we use is a, a visible and a near infrared spectrometer in order to have hypercube uh, of interest for uh, plant science. Um, so putting it, it together, making a little bit or a lot of uh, scripting um, and uh, putting uh, fiber optic uh, between uh, 
all those uh, elements uh, and we um, have a, a component uh, a setup uh, which costs uh, 400 4000 euros and allow us to have a hypercube of 100 uh, per 100 pixel in merely four hours, depending on the configuration and the level of light that uh, you uh, you can uh, obtain at the entrance of the uh, sensor. This uh, material um, in our implementation or in uh, every implementation of single pixel imaging uh, can provide uh, different levels of data uh, and uh, um, higher the level is, uh, lower the weight of the data is, uh, and uh, um, higher are the uh, uh, prior information assumptions that you made and uh, higher also is the usability for um, end user. Of the, of the material. You will uh, understand when I, I describe those three levels, you have uh, raw measured hypercubes. Uh, in uh, our solution, we have um, hypercube in the Fourier plan. So uh, the X and Y axis are uh, spatial frequencies. Um, and um, N1 data is uh, after reconstructing an image and normalizing the uh, radiometric flu, you obtain a reflectance or a flux, uh, a photon flux uh, at different wavelengths. We pick a few of them to, to see that uh, something interesting about the, the scene uh, is, is indeed popping. Um, and uh, N2 uh, trait uh, is, are about um, applicative uh, information. Uh, we can make clustering, that's what you see on the right. Um, which is a naive clustering. Uh, we use a uh, on-the-shelf method and uh, we already see uh, something quite effective. Or you can make uh, um, uh, tailored uh, trait estimation. In this case, we have uh, tried to make a biophysical estima estimation uh, through the um, cell uh, and procosine uh, model. Um, here you can see uh, one application that we tried to make uh, during spring 2020, but uh, it was a um, um, victim of the lockdown um, for the COVID constraints. Uh, we, we first scheduled to go to the field, but uh, at the end we have to, to bring back uh, the um, samples to the lab and the three duplicates with uh, a deficiency in uh, and uh, over uh, fertilized. Um, we obtained quite a good uh, angular description of uh, our scene uh, and tried to make the inversion and geophysical traits, but um, because of uh, furniture uh, shortage during this uh, crisis, uh, we could uh, have um, a projector with uh, the in near infrared um, area of the label. So it limits a lot the significance of uh, the uh, trait estimation. Um, so this is one of the results uh, uh, that we can do. And we, are, we hope that we can do, go uh, in the field this year uh, or the next. Uh, at the end, we, we will reach this field. For the next uh, work of the of our team, um, we we first work in uh, dissemination of this solution, uh, as uh, stated at the beginning of the uh, this presentation. We tr um, have the goal to uh, distribute and uh, to uh, give accessible um, uh, educative toolkit to discover the single pixel imagery or to do our, ourselves um, uh, hypercubes. Uh, we are still searching lower cost uh, spectrometers. So if you have, if you sell low cost, very low cost spectrometers, easily uh, interfaceable, I'm very interested. Uh, or if you are interested to, to add the one of those uh, set up uh, on your lab or your school, um, you can uh, also join me. Uh, we will work on usability and we are open to every contribution or ideas about uh, uh, making, it, making it more and more usable, directly usable for plant science, for your uh, jobs. Um, 
And uh, as a photonist, uh, we uh, continue to work to a, a deluxe, um, uh, high quality and um, uh, high uh, scientific instruments uh, by using other uh, modulation solution, other detectors uh, to unbound the uh, chromatic range, uh, especially accessing to the mirror. Uh, unbound application applicable scale case, uh, measuring uh, passively, uh, going to uh, quicker acquisition or going up down. To finish, I would like to thank the teams that contribute to this work. Uh, we have four colleagues from uh, Photonics Bretagne, and uh, we are uh, the authors, uh, me, myself and uh, Mathieu Ribes, uh, from uh, Arvalis Institute du Végétal. We work in uh, Brittany. And uh, the goal of uh, our teams is to bring uh, uh, optimal uh, photonical uh, solutions to, to the fields uh, to be applicable for um, agricultural and plant science. And uh, I would like to thank also the sensors, um, publications, uh, and uh, once again, IPP and uh, David and uh, Philippe to, and Jennifer and Mark to make it possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Antoine, for the uh, clear uh, talk and uh, introduction to um, the single pixel uh, um, imaging uh, system and your illustration on, uh, on plant. So thank you very much. Um, there is already some uh, question uh, raised, uh, so you can uh, please continue to uh, um, uh, print them uh, either during the talks or uh, during the discussion session, which is now open for uh, for Antoine. So uh, let's take it in, in. There is uh, a comment by uh, Felix uh, Akens. You had in your presentation that you need approximately four hours for 101 pixel. How large are you usually uh, the image um, uh, that you record and? Uh, Oh, well, that's the question. <laughs> um, we uh, are to, we measure uh, image uh, um, uh, up to 200 per 200 uh, to, to try the longest uh, acquisition possible. And uh, uh, usually for development, uh, uh, 50 by 50 or um, 80 by 80 is uh, sufficient uh, because we can, uh, because we have multi hyperspectral information on. Uh, pixels, we can afford uh, mixed pixels uh, and uh, still have uh, strong signatures into, into them. Um, and the uh, trade-off between the resolution and the time is not completely fixed because uh, you have the level of light, uh, which can reduce the individual uh, measurements. So uh, it also depends on the optical uh, solution. And uh, you can divide by two the time of acquisition if you are uh, two times um, uh, shorter to the um, to the scene. Okay. Um, so there was. I'm not sure. Felix. Uh, Felix had another part. When you uh, then record a plant 200 by 200, you take eight hours. I imagine you can only use it for measuring static information. So that's how the movement, wind, uh, if you are in the field, would uh, impact this? How is it compatible with um, like, uh, yes, a field uh, application uh, in presence of a strong winds or movement of the plants? Uh, yes. Um, in, um, in practice, the, uh, the implementation I present here is not uh, suitable for outdoor measurements. Um, but uh, we work and uh, we will continue to work on the different solution to uh, tackle this. Um, one is, uh, of the solution is um, to replace some uh, components to go faster, but uh, which is be less accessible in matter of price. Other strategies uh, we're thinking of is um, to mix uh, the different um, uh, pattern family that we can use um, uh, to, um, to track uh, the temporal evolution of, uh, of one pixel of the image in parallel of the reconstruction of the overall image. Uh, this uh, 
is theoretically possible, but we have to, to make it uh, real. So to have a kind of a spectral, spatial, and temporal uh, analysis at the same at the same time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is there any other question which were raised? So there was an indication by uh, Ahmed uh, Medipour with another illustration on a single pixel hyperspectral uh, uh, flying system uh, on a UAV. Um, so I don't know if you want to comment on this uh, on this suggestion. Uh, I can't read uh, this uh, this reference. Uh, we already uh, uh, already some uh, some acquisition in the field, and because uh, it's true that this question of movement is also related to the distance to the scene and somehow and the spatial resolution. So mm -hmm. have you tested some kind of, uh, yes, uh, embedding this on a UAV because it, it's, it seems maybe light, possibly lighter than a hyperspectral uh, uh, system? We haven't tested yet. It's a good, uh, uh, a good way to, to, a good path to investigate. Um, and the uh, solution chosen for this implementation because of the goals that we fixed are not to uh, make it unsuitable for, for this application. Um, and um, uh, single pixel imagery and the, its mat mathematic for compressive sensing is uh, something new. So we, we read a lot of papers since uh, 2010 on this subject. Uh, but uh, keep in mind that uh, the first uh, spatial uh, mission were single pixel imagers with a push broom imager or two gal galvanometers in front of it. So if you put it in the long time scale of the photonics, you, you see that uh, um, uh, we, we redo, we refine the same thing uh, again and again. And um, yeah. this time is applying it uh, to our uh, phenotyping uh, needs. Okay. Great. Uh, maybe just two more uh, questions. So, by uh, one by um, uh, Jose Ferreira El Nado. Sorry if I uh, pronounce it correctly. How do you control the intensity of light by bands from uh, the commercial uh, RGB projector? So we are back in the in the lab, and you explain how you were doing these uh, patterns. So, how do you control the the, the light by bands uh, with an uh, uh, RGB projector, which is not uh, a single uh, uh, wavelength uh, projection, yeah. but more larger. Yeah. Mm. We uh, we control the distribution of the three uh, chrome, uh, um, the three color of uh, the uh, the sensor, and we also uh, include uh, a self calibration of the um, time vari variability of uh, the uh, projector in times. So uh, we. We, we track and characterize the stability uh, of uh, the um, of uh, the successive uh, patterns um, during time, and we also uh, know the uh, the spectral contribution of the three color. Uh, at the end, for the uh, N1 uh, level of data, when we, we want to obtain a representative reflectance, um, we always use. Uh, um, a calibration uh, standard in the scene, uh, within the scene, uh, to be uh, really uh, sure of uh, to, to, to normalize uh, correctly the, the reflectance obtained. Uh, there were two last questions, maybe one from Felix again, but I guess you already gave some uh, uh, inputs and uh, perspective about the fact that uh, this is not the end of the road and there might be several tricks to speed up the, the, the process. I think you already answered uh, partially on, on this. Another from uh, Paolo uh, Herman is, um, uh, have you compared the result of a low cost spectrometer with high cost spectrometer? And uh, what, is the, um, what is the interest? Uh, I mean, in the current uh, version, how does it compare with the uh, existing uh, system? Um, I'm not sure to, 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 to catch the question because um, uh, I will respond to both of the understanding I have of this question. Uh, first of all, um, uh, if in this setup you put a low cost or a high cost spectrometer, you will have a dif significant difference in the um, time constraints uh, that you have to apply for the same uh, photon flux. 
for the same uh, amount of light uh, in the scene, uh, you will go uh, uh, faster with a high cost uh, spectrometer and uh, maybe the uh, uh, programming will be easier. Uh, and um, the other possible question, um, uh, this um, uh, solution uh, doesn't compete with uh, hyperspectral solution uh, on the shelf um, who, whose price is lowering and lowering and it, it is very interesting. Um, this uh, solution um, uh, try to share uh, the, uh, the, the, the how to do uh, the, the techniques of uh, hyperspectral, uh, conceiving hyperspectral sensors to work uh, together between the using community and uh, the, uh, the techniques community. Uh, so we are uh, very cheaper than uh, on the shelf hyperspectral uh, sensors, uh, but uh, we, we don't do a snapshot measurement. And uh, at the end, we won't be on the same segment of market from the actual uh, hyperspectral sensors that you can see here. Thank you, Antoine, for this uh, um, session of uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. I currently see no more uh, questions. So I, I propose that we uh, move to uh, the second uh, talk. And thank you again, uh, Antoine, for your contribution. Uh, Olivier, you can uh, now uh, share the, the screen and uh, launch uh, your uh, uh, presentation, uh, which will be more uh, oriented towards some um, uh, platform with low cost uh, mini computers. And uh, we're happy to, to listen to your presentation. Please. OK, you should see it now. Um, so, hi, thanks for having me over today. Have you ever wondered what differences in plant physiology arise uh, in, in one plant due to environmental changes? Well, that's the question I would like to answer in my PhD. Plants, they are complex organisms that continuously sense dynamics and changes in their environment and respond uh, to these changes. So what we try to do is capture um, the different physiological state statuses of um, plant organs uh, and monitor whether there are changes uh, occurring here. So to that end, of course, we need a sensing device. So a data logger uh, that captures each of these sensors in real time. Um, so we need to capture very rapidly all of these different changes. So to do that, we set out four key requirements that, are, that such a system should have. So first of all, it should be scalable, so it should scale from very small experiments because initially um, there are, yeah, you want to try different things uh, on a single plant. You want to see whether your setup works, but once it works, you want to scale it towards more plants uh, because you want to try a different plant species and so on. Secondly, you want it to be accurate. So you don't want your measurement system, of course, to um, be a limiting factor in the acquisition. Thirdly, it has to be low cost, so meaning it should cost lower, uh, way beyond, um, much, much lower than a thousand euros, uh, and it should be versatile. So it should suit itself towards different sensing setups and um, yeah, sensing devices um, without needing a lot of hardware changes. So initially we looked at uh, commercial solutions that are available and also at some DIY solutions such as Arduino and BeagleBone. But we didn't find any solution that really covered all of the requirements uh, that we have for our system. So either they're too expensive, they're not accurate enough, or they don't really scale well. So as a result, uh, we set out to design our own system, which we called Cloxenia, which is a system that is designed to meet all of these uh, requirements that we set out first. So the first requirement that I want to talk about is versatile. So to make it versatile, we designed the system, um, not around a single building block, but actually around several building blocks. So the, um, by combining uh, some of these blocks, you can augment the functionality of the system uh, while not having to pay, of course, for um, hardware that you don't use. So first, there is the DCO board, which is a control board that um, 
governs the sampling between the different sensors. But this board all only features digital, a digital interface. So it can uh, interface with uh, light uh, intensity sensors, relative humidity sensors, temperature sensors, but only digitally. So to augment the functionality of this digital readout, uh, we designed two analog boards, Sylvatica and Planalta, that also interface with this yoke. So Sylvatica uh, performs analog readout of up to eight sensors uh, at a lower, yeah, that need on, only need low uh, frequency measurements, meaning that um, we don't need to apply uh, an input signal and excessive filtering. So uh, as a result, we can interconnect up to eight sensors to Sylvatica, such as, for instance, leaf thickness sensors, uh, temperature sensors, um, uh, sap flow sensors, or any regular 3.3 volt sensor that just requires a steady state input. However, some sensors, such as um, leaf length and uh, bioimpedance sensors, for instance, they require an active input signal. So to this end, we designed Planalta that um, can also generate an input wave, but as a result is only capable of measuring up to four sensors on a single board. So this is what the overall interconnectivity looks like. So we have TCO that uh, essentially triggers all of the different samplings and depending on the configuration, you can augment the functionality um, with, uh, with one or more of these sensor boards. So that's how we try to make it as versatile as possible while keeping the low cost need. So secondly, there is low cost. So to make it as low cost as possible, we try to minimize the amount of analog components in the system while not requiring a multiplexed system. So we have for each channel, there is a dedicated receiver which, uh, available. But the receiver itself uses only very few components. So there is one amplifier and then a digitizer, uh, making the, yeah, the overall cost of the analog driver quite low. But this also creates several uh, trade-offs. So because we have low amount of components, there is a bit more noise coupling into the system, which can um, limit the accuracy of the system. So to tackle this, we apply um, a special kind of sampling technique that is illustrated in this figure. So usually what you, what you want to sample uh, is, of course, uh, the signal without noise, which is the orange curve. But because we use lower cost components, we actually end up with the, with the green curve. So if we sample the green curve at the lower at the frequency that we want, we end up with the blue dots, which are of course quite noisy. This is not what we want, of course. So what we what do we do? We oversample the system dramatically. So we take a lot more samples than needed, and then we apply uh, filtering techniques. Using these filtering techniques, uh, we can uh, remove most of the noise and end up with a signal that is very close to the noiseless signal, so to say, while not um, needing excessive hardware or costly hardware that has very good noise performance. Then finally, we also want a system that can scale. So for now, we talked about a system with one DCO board that is connected to several sensor boards and several digital sensors. But of course, this such a system does not scale. Either if you have a large system, you need very long interconnectivity, uh, meaning low attenuation cables, resulting in high cost. Um, so to tackle this, we added a digital interface to the DCO board that can interconnect to another DCO board. And as such, you can create a long linear chain uh, where each board can, connect, uh, can communicate with each other. And then one board has to be connected to a data logger or, or a storage device, more or less, um, that stores all of the samples because our system is not capable of storing the, the samples uh, by it on its own uh, because there is no storage available. But because of the power requirements, it has to be connected to a power supply anyhow. So this is not really a drawback of the system. So overall, when we get back to uh, the grander scheme, we can see that the system that we designed, Loxinia, 
is able to provide a better trade-off between each of these requirements. While it's not the most cost-effective system or the most versatile system, it provides a better trade-off in terms of accuracy, scale, versatility, and cost than any of these other systems that we presented. Um, so, but of course, we have to validate this setup also in real life. So we set out uh, to make an experiment uh, where we wanted to monitor these dynamic changes that occur in plants. So we um, set up a system in a growth chamber where each of the sensors was sampled every second. We have three plants, one straw, uh, two strawberry plants and a tomato plant sapling um, that were watered initially and then we let them wilt and saw what occurred to the system. Uh, so this is what we observed. So in the top figure, we see the environmental characteristics in terms of temperature and relative humidity. And in the bottom figure, we see, uh, we observe the leaf thickness on the left, and which are the green and the blue curve, um, and the leaf elongation of the strawberry plant one and the tomato uh, in the red and black curves. So what we initially observe is that everything is going fine. But after a few days, we see wilting occurring, which is, of course, what we expect because we don't water the plant, um, but only in one plant, because uh, only in strawberry plant one, because it's the biggest one, uh, just tr um, transpirating the more, uh, most water, uh, while all of the pots are the same size. So then we water, we see a quick recovery of the leaf thickness, and we see the same at the end. But if you look at this overall scheme, you might say that this system is actually quite noise sensitive because of all the different um, yeah, uh, signals over here, but it's not. When we zoom in, we will see that there's actually, this is the operation of the growth chamber that is occurring. So we will zoom in on the gray area now. And now we can already see that is indeed um, the operation of the growth chamber that is happening. And we'll zoom in even further on the other gray area. So over here, we can finally observe these different dynamics and really what the causal scale, uh, what the causal changes are uh, in the... So we see, for instance, that this um, drop in relative humidity probably uh, causes this drop uh, in leaf thickness of the strawberry plant um, because of the time, and there is some time effect uh, between the two which is of course very interesting to study because these offsets are not necessarily the same for all different uh, organs that we monitored. So that um, includes the experiment. Uh, so what I wanted to highlight to you today is that we designed a system that is suitable uh, for different experimental scales, that is accurate, low cost and quite versatile. But most of all, that should enable us to uh, monitor the dynamics of plants more accurately and consistently uh, to uncover whether there are really yeah, differences in terms of reaction speed and um, the reactions themselves uh, due to the environment of a plant. Because this is something that we believe is understudied currently um, and that might provide valuable insight towards uh, selecting uh, plants with um, increased productivity in, an, uh, in a challenging environment. And then of course, how can you use this type of system? So right now we open sourced the entire implementation. Uh, so it's available on GitHub. So you can download the, the, the design files and which components are required to make the system work and run. You can, make, you can order a board and then um, start experimenting yourself with the setup. So um, this concludes my presentation. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you very much for your, uh, your presentation. So uh, demonstrating that there was uh, interesting uh, things to be done at the level of the uh, grid, of, uh, grid of sensors with low cost technology uh, uh, perceived as a, as a wall. Um, and also for making your uh, research uh, open, uh, open source. So um, maybe uh, some uh, question on the side of uh, the participants. Not uh, uh, yet, I think maybe uh, 
There is uh, uh, one. Um, so, uh, how do you see evolution of the of the system uh, itself? Do you envision addition of uh, other sensors, or um, uh, how to deploy it in a, on a much larger scale than the demonstration you? You, you, you gave uh, in the lab uh, stuff. So what's your view on, uh, on, on this initiative? So initially, of course, we are, we are going to try to leverage the system as much as we can yeah. uh, with what we have. But um, overall, adding additional sensors should not be overly difficult because the boards are really designed to not take too much for granted in terms of the sensing, in terms of the, uh, what has to be sensed. So you can really measure any signal between um, 0 and 3.3 volts with Sylvatica. So um, if your sensor has, for instance, a 12 volts output, shouldn't be really an issue because uh, you can just attenuate it a bit uh, such that it falls between this range. But of course, if you, have, if you have a very different sensor, for instance, let's say you have a PAR sensor where you want to measure a current signal, that is not currently possible with the system. So either you need to develop some kind of interface board or a whole new board. Uh, and then to come to the second part in, in much larger experience. So right now we are indeed still at the exploration phase with, with a small scale experiments, but uh, in, in a yeah, bit more midterm future, uh, we would indeed like to, to do these bigger experiments with, a, with the canvas. Um, and the physical requirements of the canvas actually are that at full speed, one megabit per second, uh, you can have a bus length of up to 40 meters. So then you can have a physical, yeah, inter linear interconnectivity between all the nodes of 40 meters. But if you decrease the speed um, and also sample less, um, you can actually go up to um, over kilometers in terms of, uh, of length of your bus, such that you can indeed monitor uh, more plants. But initially we, we envisioned the system to work up to, yeah, let's say, 10, 15 plants from one to 10, 15 plants, because that's, you need a lot of sensors, of course, to measure these dynamics. And we don't see people actively using a system like this to monitor thousands of plants and, and like what, what yeah. Um, um, yeah, the, the vision based phenotyping is capable of doing. Okay, so it would be fully adapted to gross uh, growth chambers, uh, yeah. typically dimensions, where uh, in terms of uh, room and the dimension, and even up, upscale, possibly up to greenhouses, yes, uh, yeah. where the dimension you indicate are compatible. Yeah? Uh, yeah. And there is a, a question about the, the price of the, the Glock Senior board. Can yeah. you indicate uh, the, the cost? Yeah, so uh, the, the cost depends on what you, which border you're referring to, of course. So, but the, the price varies between um, 45 and 75 euros per board. So the, the, this year board is the cheapest because it has the least hardware on it. It's about 45 euros. Um, and then the, the most expensive is the Planalta board because it has to have this driver and the, the receiver um, requiring yeah, a bit more components, making it a bit more expensive. So, so uh, also a question from uh, pa uh, Paolo uh, mm -hmm. and, and so uh, about the, the transducer sensors that you use to be connected on Gloxenia. Yeah. So uh, about temperature, relative humidity, are, are they commercial solution or sensors you designed also? No, these are uh, commercial sensors that we borrowed from INRAI. Uh, okay. No collaboration, but I, I'm not sure which type exactly they are. They were quite old actually. Um, Basically, any sensor would fit, but there is a constraint of the voltage and the, the yeah, type indeed. of the format, yeah. uh, which is has to fit with the input of your uh, system to avoid uh, any hardware modification. Yes, exactly. Uh, but in the case of transducers, uh, there's no real limitation because um, they, they're not active sensors. So they just require, let's say they just modify the, this, the input signal that they receive. Uh, so in that case, it's the 3.3 volts. Um, limitation is not really a big limitation because we because initially the hardware that we received operated at 12 volts, volts I think um, but we just used the same hardware uh, to work at 3.3 volts. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, maybe a last question mm -hmm. from uh, Felix Akens um, about, okay, if we want to fork the, the GitHub and, and make a full installation, what is the yeah. average setup time for such a, a, a project? For how long will it take to, to deploy the, the system, if yeah. I understand well the, the, the question? Yeah, so um, the main the, the thing that will require, so there are different aspects. So first of all, you will need to build the hardware. This is, I think, the most time consuming part because you have to order the printed circuit boards and then have to um, put the components on them. So this, depending on your skill with soldering, etc., uh, will take a week uh, for a few boards. Um, yeah, in terms of soldering and then another week or two, depending on where you order it in China or, or in Europe. Um, but then uh, the software itself is mostly ready, actually. So depending on, of course, which sensors you want, you can configure it in the C code using macros. Uh, and then the, heart, then the software will, will reconfigure itself um, such that you can readily use it. But of course, if you want to use sensors that we did not write software for, you will have to update the code and provide the necessary hardware, for, uh, provide the necessary interface for that. Um, but which can take, yeah, the, the time it takes to develop one interface depends, of course, on the complexity of the system, but the analog sensing, let's say you just want to measure an analog sensor, that's actually readily available. Um, so you just have to program uh, the code onto the, the hardware and then you can start measuring at one Hertz, for instance. Uh, so that should, should be in less than a day, actually, the programming. I hope uh, this addresses the question mostly. Okay, yeah. So thank you very much again, uh, Olivier. Uh, thanks uh, for having me over. Yeah, um, you can say hello to Peter. I think he was also online. Uh, Peter Luton, I think I met him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, uh, so uh, we wish you uh, also the, the best for the, the end of your uh, PhD. Uh, if we understood mm -hmm. it was ongoing. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> and um, now we move to the last uh, presentation of uh, today's for uh, Salma uh, Samei. Salma, uh, you can uh, share the, the screen on your presentation now. Uh, Salma Samei is um, working in, in my group in, uh, in Angers and she defended her PhD a couple of uh, weeks ago. So this is a fresh uh, <laughs> work. So Salma, uh, we listen to you. Thank you for your presentation. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Salma Sami. I'm a new postdoctoral researcher at University of Angers in France. Uh, we have collaboration with uh, INRAI, and I'm so happy that uh, I present one of the, my contribution uh, to speeding up uh, image annotation uh, 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 as an article that is published with the title of Two Word Joint Acquisition Annotation of images with egocentric devices for a lower cost machine learning application in F, uh, to Apple detection. So uh, let's uh, start uh, uh, by motivation of this uh, scientific study. Uh, uh, I... Sorry, my mouse is okay. Uh, so nowadays, uh, machine learning is an uh, effective and efficient, efficient strategy to handle complexity and diversity of plant phenotyping images. Uh, among all the uh, methods of machine learning, we are interested to, uh, in supervised uh, machine learning. And uh, this uh, supervised machine learning requires large amounts of annotated data especially in the case of deep learning for training the models. But uh, what is this uh, annotation data and how we can uh, uh, usually uh, do this uh, image annotation process? Image annotation is the process of labeling the image data with certain outlines and keywords. Uh, here you can see uh, the video that we are uh, doing image annotation for wheat disease detection. Uh, based on uh, different tasks, for example, uh, classification or segmentation, the annotation can be uh, applied in different levels, such as image level, object level, or pixel levels. 
uh, and it can be done uh, by different tools and uh, usually image annotation is done manually by experts in the field to uh, by defining region in the image uh, and creating a description of those re regions. Uh, however, providing these uh, uh, annotated data set is a really uh, tedious, expensive and labor intensive task and uh, it's very time consuming. And uh, uh, we should consider that uh, this task should be done uh, accurately because uh, we want to have the highest uh, quality and accuracy uh, for our approaches. Uh, due to all the challenges uh, 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 that I mentioned, people are thinking about how they can uh, speed up the uh, annotation process. Different approaches and applications are emerged to speeding up image annotation. For example, there are applications that uh, the, uh, there has a machine learning as a back end. Uh, there is active learning, computer assistant image annotation approaches. And also, uh, uh, I uh, will present vision based image annotation. Uh, which is categorized as a human assisted image annotation uh, in this uh, presentation as a method that we propose for a speeding up image annotation. But uh, let's see what does it mean vision based image annotation. Based on different literature, which one of them is cited here, the vision is the fastest human sense based on measuring the reaction time with the compare of other human sense, especially when the object is discriminate the outliers. But how we can capture vision and uh, uh, use the information uh, of the vision to speeding up the process by using uh, eye tracking devices that you can see here, two example of uh, uh, eye tracking, a screen based and glasses uh, eye tracking devices. Uh, these uh, devices record, record field of view and gaze direction simultaneously, and they measure visual information such as fixation, gazing point, and etc. These are the sample of output data that these devices can provide for us, such as heat maps or this binding box that shows the fixation points. And uh, there are some early demonstration of using eye tracking for image annotation. And our group uh, in Anja University was one of the first one that used this technology for uh, uh, doing image annotation in agriculture in 2018. For this purpose, we use a screen-based eye tracking to annotate weeds that are, exist in the salad. Uh, there are different uh, steps. First, we, uh, we define the project based on the data set. Uh, and the task is uh, the annotator gaze to the weeds for a specific amount of the time. In the middle, you can see the trajectory of human eyes. And uh, uh, on the right side, you can see heat map generated around the fixations. Uh, we can use these heat maps to analyze the result and annotate the weeds on the, uh, on the salad. Actually, I can mention that by this approach, we accelerate the process of annotation 30 times more than manual annotation. And also the results were accurate enough for doing the, uh, the training uh, phase in machine learning. However, there are some limitations for this uh, strategy. By using this screen-based eye tracking, you saw that image acquisition and annotation are two separate process because we use this screen-based eye tracking system in the lab. Uh, we are thinking about how we can uh, reduce the time of the process by joining these two different steps together. The solution could be using egocentric or glasses eye tracking device. So, we propose the approach of uh, joint image acquisition and, uh, and annotation in the field 
by this egocentric eye tracking device. We use it to observe Apple in the field and uh, we have uh, some uh, uh, objectives like counting, localization, and positioning of the apples. To solve this question, large and diverse uh, amount of annotated data is needed. And this task could be challenging because there is a variation of illumination in the field. There is clutter from self-similar background. And also, as you can see, in the sample of data that are available in our data set, there are variety uh, of uh, apples uh, with different color and uh, different uh, uh, diversity. So this is the uh, grand truth of the data that we uh, provided manually to uh, evaluate the results. Here, uh, you can see the uh, uh, one sample of capturing directly the images and the gazing information by using egocentric eye tracking in the field. As, is, as it is uh, visible in the video, the gazing point is not exactly positioned on the center of interested object, despite the calibration that happened before the experiment. So we apply some image processing to extract attention area, this yellow line around the uh, gazing uh, point, which is this uh, green, uh, uh, green uh, point, uh, to uh, 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 define the attention area. It means uh, we need to define an area around the object of interest. The size of this area should be accurate enough to compensate the issue of the shifting of the gazing. So we call this uh, area as an attention area. And with compare of processing the whole image, the, uh, the processing of this a small attention area could be considered as a, li a light image processing. Here, you can see the pipeline of our process. First of all, we uh, acquired a data by egocentric eye tracking device. After that, we extracted frames uh, from uh, our uh, video and we uh, extract attention area around the object of interest. And uh, the extraction, this, uh, this attention area is the uh, 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 objective of this uh, study. After that, we apply segmentation by using a classical uh, super pixel segmentation like a, sl uh, a sleek. After that, we apply clustering by k-means and we evaluate the performance of our segmentation. This is the state of the art approach that we applied uh, on our study. Uh, and I cite the articles that uh, uh, developed the same uh, uh, approaches that I mentioned. But how we choose uh, the, si uh, the size of this attention area? We test various sizes and uh, we saw that uh, the, 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 there is no uh, uh, mono, uh, monotonic ev uh, evolution on this uh, 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 accuracy of the uh, uh, defining the attention area. When we consider the size of attention area very small, as you can see in the left side of the plot, uh, uh, when it's too small, we uh, have not good accuracy and we missed uh, some apples uh, uh, and uh, uh, because uh, maybe there isn't any object of interest inside the attention area. If we define it big as actually, uh, we are, uh, it's, uh, it's like that we are processing the whole scene of the uh, image and because of the complexity also the accuracy is not good enough. So we need to define an optimum uh, uh, size for this attention area and uh, uh, you can see that uh, here for example we have the uh, best accuracy when the uh, size of the uh, attention area is triple more than the average uh, size of Apple that are available in our data set. 
we compare this approach of uh, defining the attention area with different uh, strategies. For example, we have a naive baseline that we called it full frame. In this approach, we consider the size of attention area as a full frame of the image that we have. And obviously, because it's a complex scene, uh, we couldn't have the uh, good result of uh, annotation or segmentation. The second approach is saliency detection. Uh, uh, with this approach, we detect salient object in the image and there are uh, different uh, algorithms available for salient C detection. We use one of the available codes for uh, compute uh, saliency map. Uh, the computed saliency ma map then uh, thresholded uh, by binary mask and we uh, 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 produced attention area uh, uh, with the uh, uh, same size of the attention area that we uh, extracted from the previous approach around the connected components. The, uh, the third approach that we have is using a screen-based eye tracking. And this, in this approach, we do exactly, uh, we did exactly the annotation uh, by uh, uh, screen-based eye tracking. And we defined the attention area around the in, uh, 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 gazing uh, point. The fourth uh, approach is using egocentric barrier. In this approach, uh, uh, we consider that most uh, interested object is usually located in the center of the scene. And because of that, we just consider the center of the uh, scene as a attention area with the same size of the uh, previous approaches for having the fair comparison. And here you can see that among all tested methods, we found that segmentation uh, uh, and detection and localization, that uh, there are different metrics that we are uh, interested uh, in. Uh, uh, screen uh, 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 eye tracking based method provide the best uh, uh, results. We also interested uh, to uh, 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 gaining uh, of the time and uh, among uh, uh, eye tracking uh, approaches, uh, glasses eye tracking is uh, the uh, fastest approach with the compare of the uh, screen based eye uh, tracking. Uh, all in all, we demonstrate that glasses eye tracking give uh, interesting result uh, for annotation of the object uh, uh, in this use case. And also it is fast enough for uh, uh, doing the annotation jointly with uh, uh, acquisition. An uh, important result uh, uh, is despite the error shift that may be uh, happened by using this glasses eye tracking compared to uh, the accurate screen-based uh, eye tracking that we had uh, uh, in, uh, and we use it in the lab, defining this attention area accurate enough can uh, make it more, uh, that can make it robust and accurate. And uh, all of the, them is uh, because of the defining the attention area around the object of interest and the, the defining the size of the, this attention area should be accurate enough. As a conclusion, I can mention that eye tracking based devices can be used to do accurate uh, 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 and remote uh, annotation. And the glasses uh, eye tracking because it's uh, joint image acquisition by image annotation together can reduce the time significantly. And also it was the first time that uh, we showed uh, the uh, possibility of doing image annotation in the field for plant phenotyping applications. Uh, so as you know that this uh, uh, article is published in Sensor uh, Journal uh, 2020 and you can have access to it. Uh, and I would like uh, to mention that uh, this uh, work is uh, an uh, going uh, project. So we are trying to uh, define 
uh, uh, protocols for doing annotation by using vision uh, for other uh, objectives in our group. And you, uh, here you can see uh, two different uh, ongoing projects. Uh, the first one is leaf segmentation. And uh, it's uh, like that we put the seeds and we uh, 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 do the trajectory and uh, uh, we annotate the center of the leaf. And after that, we apply region growing around the, uh, this annotation part to segment leaf separately. And the second one is uh, root segmentation that uh, you can see here, we can uh, detect the root tip. And after that, we can trajectory to find the lateral root. And after that, uh, we apply a skeletal uh, noise. So these are the ongoing projects in our group based on uh, using eye tracking. But uh, when, we, when the objects of interest are uh, very close to each uh, other, uh, using these eye tracking devices can be very tiring for human eyes. The second approach that uh, we have uh, also a publication uh, on that is using computer assisted image annotation. And uh, by this, we, uh, we meant that uh, we use a simulator uh, to define, uh, to uh, generating uh, data for uh, for example, uh, modality that maybe they are not annotated, available annotated data set. You can have uh, access uh, to this uh, article uh, as well, and this is presented in a CBPR conference 2019. And uh, this is the uh, end of my presentation, and thank you so much for uh, listening. I'm happy for if you have any question uh, to answer. Thank you, Salma, for your presentation. Um, there is already a question by uh, Ednaldo. Uh, uh, have you already tried a UNET deep learning for segmenting uh, block in pipeline? Why using clustering task instead of a supervised learning? So well, I would uh, maybe rephrase it. Why don't you use deep learning to do uh, the, the Apple detection? Uh, actually, uh, uh, for uh, uh, for applying uh, deep learning or a unit, uh, for example, for segmentation, as you know, we need to have large amount of annotated data. And as you uh, saw, these uh, data are uh, uh, acquired in the field by ourselves, by our group, and uh, we uh, and. Uh, uh, we consider that there isn't uh, available annotated data set for this kind of task. And we want to see that uh, how we can speed up uh, the process of annotation. Uh, but uh, for uh, using deep learning, uh, especially we need to have uh, annotated data set as well. Uh, and uh, it, it is the case uh, for uh, this approach that why we uh, didn't use deep learning. Okay, so you didn't use deep learning, but it would be the next step after you have annotated images. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, next question would be, okay, uh, you have used your Apple annotation system. Uh, have you used it for any field uh, application? Uh, meaning, um, what, what are you going to use it uh, for? So counting number of apples, measuring diameter, uh, what can be done on the annotated data? Actually, uh, the, uh, the objective of this annotated data, as I mentioned here, uh, were, uh, uh, for example, a localization. Uh, it was counting the apples, and also we can uh, use it for uh, generate the annotation. Uh, for, uh, each, uh, for each of uh, these um, uh, approaches, uh, we can say that uh, using this egocentric or glasses eye tracking could be accurate enough uh, if you define the size of attention area uh, uh, good enough, it can be accurate for uh, uh, doing all these uh, three uh, objectives. Yeah, so uh, you mean that at the moment you are not uh, fully processing the, the data, maybe there is post-processing in the end, for instance, uh, if uh, you want to count apples and you have uh, annotated um, uh, uh, part of the images which correspond to cluster of apples, 
this was not in your uh, in your focus to do this post processing. No. This post processing is necessary, whatever the approach. If you do manual annotation or if you do eye based uh, annotation. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, a new question by uh, Felix. Uh, have you try? Have you also tried combining different approach uh, to design, using the data from the eye tracking because you now compare only the different method, uh, only the different methods. Uh, so, okay, I'm not sure I understand. Approach of uh, utilizing the data from the eye tracking. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, maybe uh, uh, if I understand well, can, could you combine uh, information from the gain from the eye tracking with other uh, yeah. uh, signals or other information? Because uh, now you compare them, but could you fuse uh, them? Uh, actually, if uh, if I uh, uh, understood the question correctly, yes, uh, we can uh, use the information that uh, is uh, extracted uh, by eye tracking because uh, we uh, this kind of uh, uh, we, we can uh, simulate this uh, gazing information actually. Uh, uh, and uh, also with this egocentric barrier approach, we can uh, simulate the uh, uh, information that we are extracting from uh, the, the eye tracking systems. And it could be uh, maybe a lower uh, uh, cost approaches to uh, jointly uh, use uh, egocentric barrier information plus maybe saliency or simulating gazing uh, 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 behavior of the human eye to have an alternative approach for using these egocentric eye tracking devices. Yeah, so the, it would be just glasses with uh, uh, 10 euros or 100 euro glasses with a camera on and you would use the uh, egocentric prior plus your saliency. Saliency uh, uh, detection yeah. approach, yeah to simulate uh, the, exactly uh, the same information that we can extract from this uh, egocentric device. Okay. Okay. Um, I see at the moment no additional um, question uh, raised. So maybe if no other comments or question, um, we can thank the, the three uh, speakers. So we had a, uh, Presentation at the level of more fundamental with Antoine, and then uh, something more at the level really of the sensor and the network of uh, electronic devices to, to couple with this sensor. And here it was more on the side of uh, machine learning sensors that could be used for um, machine learning. Uh, so there will be, uh, there was a recording of the of the talk. I think there will be like um, the previous. Um, uh, like the previous uh, uh, events, uh, be available uh, on uh, online for this published uh, work. And uh, so we recall that uh, you have all the, the links for the survey, and uh, which is available. Uh, Mark recalled the, the, these links. Also, that you have, uh, if you want to join activity of the working group on affordable phenotyping, there is also uh, an email address you can. Uh, uh, connect to, to us. And um, then I think this is it. Uh, uh, we wish you the best uh, in your activities uh, and uh, take care uh, in these uh, sanitary uh, difficult times. Thank you, David. Alors, on vous l'envoie en dernière fois. Et la présentation, on peut la renvoyer.